O eternal and almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are assembled here before thee to frame such laws as may tend to the welfare and prosperity of our province. Grant, O merciful God, we pray thee, that we may desire only that which is in accordance with thy will, that we may seek it with wisdom and know it with certainty and accomplish it perfectly for the glory and honor of thy name and for the welfare of all our people. We acknowledge we are gathered on Treaty 1 territory and that Manitoba is located on the treaty territories and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Anishian, Inuak, Dakota Oyate, Dene Sulane, and Nihithuwag nations. We acknowledge Manitoba is located on the homeland of the Red River Métis. We acknowledge Northern Manitoba includes lands that were and are the ancestral lands of the Inuit. We respect the spirit and intent of treaties and treaty making and remain committed to working in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis people in the spirit of truth, reconciliation and collaboration. Good morning, everybody. Please be seated. Orders of the day, private members' business, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Yes, thank you. Madam Speaker, I would like to call Bill 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act. It has been announced that the House will consider second reading of Bill 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act. The Honourable Member for Lavarondre. I move, seconded by the Member for Swan River, the Bill Number 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act, be now read a second time and referred to a committee of this House. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for Lavarandre, seconded by the Honourable Member for Swan River, that Bill Number 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Member for Lavarandre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Being of Ukrainian descent, I am pleased to bring forward Bill 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act, for debate in this chamber today. This bill pro proclaims the month of September as Ukrainian Heritage Month. Some may ask why the month of September? Well, the first official Ukrainian immigrants, Vasil Ilnyak and Ivan Pilipiu, arrived in Canada on September 7, 1891. And soon afterwards, Ukrainian immigrants began arriving in Manitoba in larger numbers. I know that my grandfather arrived here in 1896. He settled in the Gardenton, Sturtburn, Vita area of southeastern Manitoba. Over the years, many Ukrainians have fled their homeland to find freedom from oppression and a better life in Canada. When the first Ukrainian settlers arrived in Manitoba, times were not easy, but their determination the work e and their work ethic allowed them to survive and become an important part of Manitoba history. Manitoba is a province with rich culture from many countries, and the Manitobans of Ukrainian descent have left and continue to leave a historic mark on our province, and their contributions span communities across Manitoba and are reflected in our economic, political, social, and cultural life. Their food, song, and dance are a great part of Manitoba. Ukrainian Canadians have played an important role in the development of Manitoba into one of the most desirable places in the world to live, work, and call home. It is important to recognize and celebrate these contributions. More than 180,000 Manitobans identify as being of Ukrainian descent. Bill C-314, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act, was introduced in the House of Commons of Canada on June 17, 2021. Other provinces have looked at similar legislation. It is time for Manitoba to recognize and celebrate the contributions that Ukrainians have made to Manitoba and support Bill 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act. Ukrainians have always been an important part of Manitoba 
And it's time for Manitobans to be an important part of Ukraine. It has been more than a month since Vladimir Putin and his forces invaded Ukraine. Since the start on February 24th, the invasion has only escalated, targeting bombings of, Ukrainians, of Ukraine's hospitals, residential areas and apartment blocks, orphanages, malls, schools, and shops have increased. Every day, there are more reports of the damage to property and deaths of civilians that Putin is inflicting on Ukraine. Ukrainian is no stranger to conflict, being the breadbasket of Europe. Throughout the years, there have been many attacks on Ukraine. In 1932 and 33, under the Soviet communist regime of Joseph Stalin, around 7 million Ukrainians were starved to death during the Holodomor. This genocide is one atrocity that Ukrainians have endured. Because of the current invasion of Ukraine, close to 4 million people have fled Ukraine, seeking refuge in other countries. There is much that can be done to help Ukrainians fleeing a war they did not want nor start. Our government is working with organizations such as the Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Manitoba, the Canada Ukrainian Foundation, the Canadian Red Cross, and other community organizations to address this human humanitarian crisis. To date, Manitoba has donated more than $800,000 for humanitarian relief and will continue to support Ukraine in any way we can. <clears throat> Our Manitoba government is working with the federal government to make sure that Ukrainians seeking immigration or come as refugees to Manitoba will seek a full, will receive a full range of supports. Our government has started a working group to evaluate the government's services needed for Ukrainian citizens once they arrive in Manitoba. Manitoba is preparing for the arrival of a large number of Ukrainian citizens, seeking a safe haven in Manitoba. A special deputy minister steering committee has been established. A new Ukrainian refugee task force led by emergency measures organization has begun to plan and, or and coordinate efforts to help Ukrainian citizens. Our government knows we will need a full range of provincial settlement support services to support thousands of Ukrainian families fleeing the war in Ukraine. Housing, health care, mental health services, K-12 education, child care, English language services, social assistance, employment assistance, and more. Manitoba remains fully committed to welcome as many Ukrainians as possible fleeing this unprovoked and terrible war. We will continue to work with the federal government to prior, prioritize applications and process documents of Ukrainians wishing to come to Manitoba. I am proud of the many Manitobans that have stood up in support of Ukraine and condemning Putin for his unprovoked war on Ukraine. And can, uh, for, Manitobans have always been known for their generosity when it comes to helping others. I would like to thank the many Manitobans that have contributed to humanitarian relief for Ukraine. No matter how small or large the contribution may be, it all helps. I could speak longer on Bill 223, but I will give the many others that would like to speak in support of this bill the opportunity to do so. Slava Ukraini, thank you, Yaku. A question period of up to 10 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the sponsoring member by any member in the following sequence. First question to be asked by a member from another party. This is to be followed by a rotation between the parties. Each independent member may ask one question, and no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The Honourable Member for Burroughs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to say thank you to the member opposite for bringing out this, uh, bringing forward this uh, bill, which is very important. It's important to recognize contribution of our uh, Ukrainian Manitobans to our economy. Uh, 
commemoration of Ukrainian heritage is important, and uh, it's also ex extremely important uh, that real and tangible measures are put in place today to help Ukrainian people. Uh, what new measures is the member prepared to support today? The Honourable Member for Lever Andre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. It's uh, new measures. We are have committees organized. We have already contributed over eight hundred thousand dollars. And I guess as we know, how many new like Ukrainians will be coming to Manitoba? then we can look at what will be needed. I mean, we are addressing the needs that are there right now, or will be there, education, health care, but we don't know exactly what will be needed in the future as, as, as refugees and people wanting to immigrate here arrive. The Honourable Member for Springfield, Rishat. I'd like to thank the member for this uh, bill. And in light of the events in Ukraine over the past 36 hours, can the member please explain the increased importance of September as Ukrainian Heritage Month? The Honourable Member for Lavar Andre. Thank you. And I thank the member very much for that question. Well, September is an important month for Ukrainian heritage because it is the month that the first Ukrainian settlers did arrive in Canada. Uh, Ivan Ilyinyuk and Ivan Pilipu. I mean, it, it is important, and there are other areas that are looking at doing similar legislation. So it would, September is the month that, that I believe plays an important role for the, the Ukrainian population in Canada. So if the federal government is going to have a Ukrainian Heritage Month or other provinces have a Ukrainian Heritage Month and September is the month, I believe that it is important that we follow that tradition. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for bringing forward this legislation. I was wondering if the member had the opportunity to specifically work with the Ukraini Ukrainian Canadian Congress, UCC, on the creation of this legislation, very specifically. The Honourable Member for Lavrandre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And yes, I did meet personally with Joanne Lewandowski from the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. She took this, uh, like, my idea to, to her committee and, and win it over. Like, this is not the first time that this type of bill has been introduced. Back in 2016, I had a bill very similar to this that was on the order paper but never made it to the floor of the House. Uh, the NDP brought a bill forward back in 2011 uh, where they did introduce the last Saturday of uh, July as Ukrainian Heritage Day in order to promote the Ukrainian festival in Dauphin. So it, it is something that has been talked about. I listened the to The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Honourable Member for um, St. Vital. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it's really important for us to support the people in Ukraine, the Ukrainian people who are going through such a difficult time uh, suffering through the violence perpetrated by Putin's regime uh, with this war. We're offering uh, a lot of supports in Canada and Manitoba specifically. And you know, we have also brought forward uh, a number of urgent matters that would increase the settlement for Ukrainian people, such as funding and staff support, increasing of those here in Manitoba, especially for the provincial nominee program. Will the member support our call for increased funding and increased supports to help settlement, uh, Ukrainians settle in Manitoba? The Honourable Member for Lavar Andre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And of course, like our government has stated, that we will welcome as many Ukrainians to Manitoba as, as possible. And with, the, with that, of course, there will be more funding that will be necessary. But we can't, I don't think the member can tell me exactly how many refugees or people wanting to immigrate are, are going to come here. If he could, you know, say a number of 2,000, 10,000, whatever. I don't think we know that. So, yes, as the the number of refugees in that enter Manitoba, there will be more money that will be needed, of course. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Thank you, and thank you to the member from La Verandre for bringing this very important bill forward. Can the member speak to the personal relationship with uh, their Ukrainian heritage? The Honourable Member for La Verandre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Swan River. This is probably one that <laughs> might touch me a little bit. Uh, my personal relationship with my grandfather and his <laughs> immigration to Canada. 
Um, <laughs> sorry. He immigrated here in 1896. He settled. He had uh, 12, him and his wife had 12 children, of which all of them were very prosperous and, and did well and cre uh, uh, supported and, and did a lot for Manitoba in all the years that they were around. Unfortunately, they are all passed now. The Honorable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to... Oh, oh pardon me, the uh, independent member only gets one question. The Honorable Member for Burroughs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for uh, sharing uh, his family story. Every uh, immigrant has their own story, and uh, uh, most of them have painful ones. So just wanted to uh, know uh, from the member, what is the Ukrainian Manitoban community calling for from this provincial government as the Russian invasion of Ukraine unfolds? The Honorable Member for Lever Andre. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for that question. I didn't quite hear it all, but if I'm correct, the member was asking what the different uh, organizations are calling from, for the, from the Manitoba government. Of course, in, in a situation like this with the war in Ukraine, the, the most important part, of course, is we need uh, humanitarian relief for the Ukraine. There are uh, a lot, I mean, our government has donated over $800,000, but I was just reading an article, the Canadian Red Cross has raised over $59 million for humanitarian aid. And, and I think it's important that we continue as as what is necessary, what is needed or asked for by these organizations, we look at it and, and donate accordingly. The Honorable Member for Springfield, Rashad. Can the Member for Lavarandre share how this bill will affect his constituents and those of all members of this legislature? The Honorable Member for Lavarandre. Well, I, I think this bill is very self-explanatory. It, it honors and uh, all of the Ukrainians that are in Manitoba by, by putting a month aside where we can honor all the contributions that have been made by Ukrainians, of, of Manitobans of Ukrainian descent. I mean, it, it is important. I mean, we do have other uh, months that we have set aside, whether, I know right now we're in the Sikh Heritage Month, there's the Filipino. There are a number of, of, of other, I guess, e ethnic groups that have been recognized, and I think it's very important and Manitoba is one of those provinces that does look after everybody who's contributed to Manitoba. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. Mattel. Madam Speaker, I think it's really important that we acknowledge and celebrate Ukrainian history here in Manitoba, especially at such a difficult time. And so given the challenges that Ukrainians face fleeing their war-torn country, Will this government commit to resourcing the provincial nominee program so that there are sufficient staff to process applications timely? The Honourable Member for Lavarandre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for St. Patel. I believe in my speech I had, I had talked about that several committees have been uh, set up, the emergency measures has, has looked at, and, and as it's needed, like right now, I, I, the federal government is basically in charge of, of immigration and that. So as we get people into Manitoba, of course, we will have to staff up in order to handle that. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Can the member provide a situation of how Ukrainians in Manitoba have contributed to their community and the constituency? The Honourable Member for Lavarandre. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for uh, Swan River. Ukrainians, when they first immigrated to Canada here in the late 1800s, they were not given the, the best land that there is in Manitoba because they wanted wood. They wanted to make sure that they had wood to build their homes and, and heat their homes. So some of the areas that they were given in southeastern Manitoba, there was lots of wood, but there was also lots of stones. There's some land that I was working last summer 
And I got to realize that this land has never been worked before. And the work that our forefathers did to, uh, to make Manitoba a better province is extremely important. The time for this question period has expired. Debate is open. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague from La Verandre for bringing forward this bill here today. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the uh, memories that he shared about his uh, family. Certainly, uh, it's always a significant moment when we see a colleague uh, moved uh, in such a fashion. I wanted to share uh, briefly today um, the context for why I think this bill is important and uh, should be passed. A few weeks ago, we were at the Dauphin King's Ukrainian Night, as I've shared previously in a member statement, and I had the uh, honor of being asked to introduce uh, one of the uh, children's dance groups. This uh, group in particular was uh, called uh, Zirka. And what I shared there with the members is that, you know, Manitoba has long been uh, a home base, if you will, for Ukrainian language and culture and identity. And right now, given what's happening overseas, to see children able to practice the culture and speak the language of their ancestors is very significant. I would say that it's become even more clear how significant that is given the atrocities that are being disclosed in Bucha and other parts of Ukraine as we speak. The war crimes uh, are very troubling, are certainly crimes against humanity, and on a personal level are very sad to see the video and photographic evidence of, to hear the testimonials and to read the testimonials of women who are raped in the presence of their children is outrageous. It offends me as a human being. To see the image of a man lying dead in the street with an open bag of groceries is horrifying and ought to move all of us to take whatever action we can to bring about a just resolution to this situation. And to see the mass graves calls to mind some of the most dark periods in our history as human beings. But beyond the emotional impacts of witnessing, reading, and observing these crimes against humanity, what troubles me is the story that Vladimir Putin and others in the Russian elite, including the state media, are trying to use as uh, so-called justifications for these aggressions and for these uh, very damaging things. In particular, we know that Vladimir Putin, at the outset of this war, uh, at the outset of this invasion, sought to deny the existence of Ukrainian language, culture, and identity. We read now, at the same time, that evidence and data is being collected, which we believe should someday be used to prosecute these war crimes perpetrated under uh, Vladimir Putin, that at the very same time that people like Human Rights Watch and international observers are collecting this evidence, that there are those in Russian state media who are calling for the complete destruction of Ukrainian uh, identity. When we are up against such a clear articulation of hatred and denial of not only language and culture but also of humanity, to me it speaks to the importance of why in a jurisdiction like Manitoba there is a need to set aside a month to continue recognizing the day, to resource the festivals and schools and churches that will continue to allow Ukrainian identity to continue and to flourish into the future. 
Certainly, we stand with Ukraine. We support the courage of the Ukrainian people who are fighting with all their might against Russian forces. And I think we've all been moved by President Zelensky. But I guess for me, the bill uh, takes on an added meaning. At any time, we would support the celebration of Ukrainian heritage, for sure. But given what is happening and the existential threat to an independent Ukraine and to the people who constitute that nation, again, we must remember that a nation is not simply a line on a map. A nation is a people. A nation is their lives collectively articulated in the practice of a culture, a religion, and uh, an identity. That with those things under threat, it becomes so much more important for us to take these measures, to support them in this way. Some people sometimes diminish the importance of symbolism. And they say, oh, symbolism, that's just a symbolic gesture, and try to write things off like that. But speaking as somebody who's had to claw his way up, speaking as somebody who comes from a community that has had to fight for every single right and that has never had anything granted to us easily in this country, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that symbolism does matter. Symbolism is important because it is the thing that keeps you going when you question yourself as to why you are undergoing these travails. Symbolism matters because it is the light at the end of the tunnel that drives you to take another step forward. And so this bill is a recognition day act, yes. But in the act of that recognition, there is meaning and there is hope and there is motivation that can be delivered to a community. But if we reflect on the fact of how we've all been moved by this, I think there is meaning to be derived for all of us. And what I mean by that is this. We've heard the words of President Zelensky articulating how his conflict, the conflict of his nation, I should say, is not just about Ukrainian independence, but he also wraps that up in the values of democracy and liberty and freedom. And so for all of us, including those of us who may not have been able to vote in previous parts of this country or this province's history, I think we've all been very, very moved and called to action to stand up in the name of liberty, in the name of freedom, and in the name of democracy. And so with that in mind, yes, this bill uh, should move forward. Yes, there should be humanitarian assistance. There should be more humanitarian assistance. There should be more resettlement programs. But where crimes against humanity that call to mind some of the darkest parts of our collective history are taking place, there must also be further action. There must be action to ensuring that those who are attempting to flee the atrocities are kept safe. Our team is very clear as well that lethal aid must be provided to Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are fighting. They are fighting for themselves, but they are also fighting for the things that we believe in, like democracy and liberty. And democracy and liberty must prevail. And as the evidence of these crimes against humanity are being collected, there also needs to be leadership to ensure the chain of custody of that evidence is intact so that a future prosecution of war crimes against Putin and others can be successful. And so as we sit here today, stand in our places to speak in support of this bill, and I'm sure that every colleague will speak in support of this bill, we should also recommit to action. We should recommit to action, one, with the recognition that when it comes to the situation in Ukraine, that Canada must be a leader at the international level for those things that I just articulated. And given what my colleague from Avarandre has said, what my colleagues from the other 56 constituencies will say, if Canada is to be a leader at the international level on the topic of the war in Ukraine, 
then Manitoba should play a leadership role among the provinces. And so I would hope that in addition to the support for this bill today, that we as legislators in Manitoba marshal that support and put action behind the words that we've all said recently of Stand With Ukraine. The Honourable Member for Springfield, Rashad. Madam Speaker, I'd first of all like to thank the Member for Lavarandre for putting forward this bill. It's an important bill in front of this legislature, and I know many wish to speak to it. I'd like to thank the Member for Lavarandre for his passion. Uh, these are uh, very troubling times uh, for us as a world, uh, destabilizing for us as a world, and we know that there are a lot of things that are taking place that are troubling. So I, I would like to reference that in the last 36 hours, the town of Bucha, B-U-C-H-A, has been liberated. And the uh, Ukrainian military has found that the killing of civilians by the Russian military was taking place. They have found several mass graves. And as President Biden has now referred to it as a war crime, the uh, potential of mass killings of civilians in Ukraine seems now to be a policy of the Putin military and of the government. Even more troubling, uh, there is an article today out in RIA Novestia, N-O-V-O-S-T-I. It's an editorial by Timofey Sergeyev, and he terms it, what Russia should do with Ukraine. You haven't seen a perfect example of Russian chauvinism, it would be in that title. And it goes on to suggest that what needs to be done is the de-Ukrainianization of that land. And I quote, the idea of Ukrainian culture and identity is fake. That is an article that just came out in the last uh, 12 hours. And Madam Speaker, this would have been approved by Putin and by the Kremlin. If you understand the way the system works there, these kinds of articles are not produced, are not published, just randomly. They don't have the same kinds of freedoms we have here. This would have been approved. So we stand here today in the Manitoba legislature, way out on the Canadian prairies where uh, cool winds still blow and we have a lot of snow and you wonder, so uh, why this? Why today? In fact, I had the opportunity to ask the member for Lavrandre the question, explain the importance of September as Ukrainian Heritage Month. Why now? Also, uh, could the member explain how his constituents and all members' constituents would be affected by this? I would suggest that we are now facing uh, the kind of things that we saw, whether it was the Holodomor, Holocaust, great leap forward, killing fields, and the list goes on and on and on. We are at the potential moment in history of humankind where again we could see the massacre of civilians by another nation. And uh, from what we understand, that has taken place. The President of the United States, who would have far more insight and far more briefings than we would have here today, has now referred to it as a war crime. So, of what value is it of us to, debate, to be debating something like this? And uh, I, I would put forward that we as the Western world must stand up. And again, we all don't have the same kind of means that a President of the United States or Prime Minister of Canada, for instance, has far more say, far more sway. But I would suggest that in every region of this country, every village, every town, every city, and every province we get up and talk about what's going on. And how timely, and I'd say to the member for Lavarandre, how timely it is to have brought forward this motion. And yes, I have been in this legislature for a, a, a few years, maybe not quite as many as, the, uh, as her speaker, or uh, the speaker, uh, however, uh, we have been through many of these, and there were times when there was a MLA Len Durkach on the conservative side, and 
Dave Chomiak was the member on the NDP side, and we did many of these kinds of resolutions, and we had many of these debates, and it was always harmonious. And I'd like to thank the members opposite for, uh, for their support of this as well, because this now transcends politics. This now even transcends uh, regional jurisdictions or provincial jurisdictions. This now has become a world issue. And what we've seen in the last 36 hours has shown us that we must stand and we must stand. We, we can't stand on the international stage and we don't go to international world conferences. This is our domain here in this chamber. And we are doing our part. And I, and I hope that when this bill is done that we do send it to the Prime Minister and we do send it to the leaders of the opposition in Ottawa and that we do send it to the Foreign Affairs Minister and perhaps even to the Minister of Defence because it says to our national leadership that it doesn't matter where we are in this country that we support the Western civilization and I would suggest that it is the entire world that is now with horror recoiling at what's going on in Ukraine and that we stand with our leadership and we stand united because we cannot and must not just stand by and let this take place. So we're going to declare September as uh, Ukraine Heritage Month and for those of us who um, come from a Ukrainian background, uh, I've already pointed out to this legislature, my father was born there of, of German heritage, but was born in Ukraine in that beautiful town called Sauchuvka, which I would point out to this chamber as they were being kicked out of their town. As they left, they could see the flames burning their village. It was burnt down and raised. It is now nothing more than a field. In fact, I think I pointed out to this legislature, I had the opportunity to see approximately where it would have been. And, um, and there was a farmer out uh, working the field, and uh, there is no town of Sauchuvka. The Russians destroyed it. It is their policy that, that when they kick people out, they destroy all the dwellings and everything else that exists, because then there is nothing to go home to. And you can see that policy. Unfortunately, now, they're also starting to take on the civilians. And what we are starting to see is perhaps a mass murder on quite a scale. So again, the question is, um, what do we do going forward? And I was listening to members opposite and, and, and other debates. So what do we do going forward? What do we do as a province? What do we do as individuals? And I think we have seen in Manitoba what we always do. We open up our hearts. We open up our wallets. The government of Manitoba has put forward more than 650,000 and then some, and we see that Manitobans are prepared to open up their homes. We would like to ask the federal government, we saw one of the members of parliament um, who, uh, who we know in this chamber uh, quite well, he uh, used to serve here with distinction, and asked about you know, how, Canada, how Manitoba could do its part for Canada's effort with Ukraine, and we would like to ask uh, the government of Canada if they would then start identifying a certain number that Manitoba would take. I believe Manitobans are prepared to step into the crease and be able to help out. I uh, got an email the other day asking for individuals who had some Ukrainian language skills if they would be prepared to be greeters in the event that uh, a larger uh, groups of Ukrainians arrive, that they could greet them. We have that beautiful hug rug at the uh, Manitoba airport and they could greet them there and greet them with open arms. Uh, these individuals will be devastated for the fact that not just did they have to leave their homes, but chances are they will have no homes to go to. So it's important that we do our part. We, we can't, uh, uh, we, we all can't be speaking for the country, that's the Prime Minister and the federal government, but we can do our part here. And that's, uh, uh, I think the lesson that we take out of this chamber is that we do have the opportunity to speak for Manitoba and for all Manitobans, and we say, first of all, that we condemn the kind of killings, the war crimes that are being perpetrated upon the civilians of Ukraine, number one. That we are prepared to stand with Ukraine, and I understand the federal government is increasing uh, their military aid to Ukraine. That is very important, and we support that as well. But also that we will, in, in embrace and we will love and cherish and support and take care of anybody who comes to Manitoba from that war-torn uh, country and we will give them a warm place and we will do so with 
love and affection, and I know that uh, members of this chamber will be with that as well. And uh, I'd like to thank the member for Lavarandre for having brought this forward. Absolutely, we should proclaim September as Ukrainian Heritage Month. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Honourable Member for St. John's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just want to take a couple of uh, minutes to put a couple of words on the record uh, here this morning. So first and foremost, I'll say miigwech to our colleague in the chamber here for bringing forward Bill 223. Uh, it's an important bill, and certainly everyone on this side of the House supports this bill, uh, and so miigwech for that. In the last uh, three weeks, there's been uh, a trickling of information coming in um, of reports of rape of Ukrainian women and girls. And uh, certainly in the last uh, 32, 36 hours, we've uh, seen the uh, proof of that as more and more stories have come forward of Ukrainian women um, and girls uh, tortured raped, massacred, and even in one case, as I'm sure most people have seen the pictures of a woman tied up and branded with a swastika. Um, girls as young as 10 years old, little babies being raped. Ukrainian women as senior as 60 years old being raped and gang raped by Russian soldiers. It is a grotesque uh, testament to uh, how savage Putin is, to as has been done for generations and generations, uh, use sexual violence and rape against innocent women and children as a tool of war. Uh, it is, uh, we should all be angered. We should all be enraged at the images that are coming out of Ukraine right now um, in respect of the sexual violence against Ukrainian women and girls trying to flee uh, a war and occupation of, uh, let's be honest, a madman, a psychopath. And I know that you know we're, we're not supposed to be uh, saying those type of things, but he is savage. Um, I want to, um, uh, in the last little uh, while, uh, some women, some survivors have actually come forward and filed uh, formal complaints of rape and sexual violence against Russian soldiers to the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. And I want to just take a moment to uh, acknowledge the profound courage that it takes for women to go forward with formal complaints of something that is so brutal. Uh, and so I lift up those women and the courage that they had in moving forward with a formal complaint. Uh, a lot of words have been spoken here this morning about um, uh, acts of war here uh, that we are seeing and that uh, uh, Putin is a war criminal and should be brought to international justice. Uh, finally, I just wanna say this, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, lately uh, directed to uh, the Russian people. And, and we know that the Russian people live under uh, uh, an oppressive regime, uh, but it is uh, also their responsibility to stand up. And I know that that's easier said than done, but it is their responsibility to stand up and demand an end to uh, what we're seeing in the Ukraine and certainly demand an end to the rape and sexual violence against women and girls. I encourage uh, uh, the Russian people to stand up, to stand up and demand this, this stop and, and stand up to Putin as, as, as easy as that may be for us to be saying that here in this chamber. Um, 
And then finally, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the women and the girls of Ukraine, to all the people of Ukraine, we on this side of the house and certainly everybody in this chamber uh, stand in solidarity with them and uh, we are with them every step of the way. Miigwech. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member once again for bringing forward this legislation today. And I'll just speak briefly here because we want to ensure the legislation does pass as everyone here in this House is in support of it. Madam Speaker, here in Manitoba, we have over 180,000 Manitobans with Ukrainian heritage, and it's overwhelmingly evident the support that we are all wanting to send and contribute, and that we all need to send and contribute to Ukraine. And there are many ways that we can be showing our support in more ways than we are currently, Madam Speaker. We know that those with Ukrainian heritage have contributed so much to our economy, to our diversity, and to so many of us on individual levels. And this is in part why we have a responsibility of doing everything in our power right now to give back and to help save lives of those living and fleeing Ukraine right now. I appreciate what has been uh, included in this legislation, talking about the first Ukrainian immigrants arriving in Canada on September 7th and why it is the month of September would be uh, designated as Ukrainian Heritage Month appreciate the population of Ukrainian descent in Canada and how all this information and the statistics were shared in the legislation. I personally really appreciate the Ukrainian famine and genocide that it was included in the legislation. The Holodomor, Madam Speaker, something that I don't think we necessarily talk about enough here in these chambers, considering how many people's lives here in Manitoba were affected by it. I personally find myself reflecting on a trip that my father and I took to Ukraine just a few years back, Madam Speaker, and I remember spending time in and around the National Museum for the Holodomor, and it was by far one of the most heartbreaking things I have ever experienced and witnessed and learned about, and you sort of carry it with you. It's a sense of somberness that you do. You carry it with you for the rest of your life, Madam Speaker. I catch myself thinking about the deep metro stations. I remember being in Ukraine thinking about the cool infrastructure of, like, these are metro stations. You stand at the top of the escalator, Madam Speaker, and you cannot see the bottom. They are very, very long and deep underground. But now, all I think about when I think about the metro stations are people hiding out in them, seeking safety. I want to thank the member for sharing a little bit about his own cultural heritage and his family of origin. And I know it's not easy to share personal stories like that in these chambers, but I think that is a really, really important part of introducing legislation like this. And I think it's very appropriate and I'm very happy that this member was the member to bring this legislation forward. Madam Speaker, I think it's important to honor in this legislation that we also recognize the honor and bravery of Ukrainian people. The legislation should recognize the labor movement and the Ukrainian labor temple that is a great source of pride and a gathering place here today in Manitoba. It's a beautiful building with a vibrant history that was built in 1919, and it stands as a cultural meeting place symbolizing social optimism and opportunity. I'm proud that it's still used to this day very regularly in the north end of Winnipeg. With all the ongoing going war crimes and atrocities happening right now in Ukraine, we do need to do more. And I think we've heard this from all members of the House who have spoken this morning already. And we know there are, I want to say, small things we can do as far as increasing the staff with the provincial nominee program. There are small things we can do with helping with documentation and assisting in resettling when Ukrainians begin coming to Manitoba. I also think that we could be making things a little bit clearer. I know this was about a week ago and I still haven't received an answer, but I had someone reach out to me and said like, Cindy, if I pay for my friend to come here, they're currently in Poland, they fled from Ukraine to Poland, if I pay for their flight to come here, will they be allowed to stay in Winnipeg? And we should have answers for this already, Madam Speaker. And I do think that this is an issue at large at both, uh, on the three levels of government, 
federal level, provincial level, and city level. And I think we could be better working together to get some of these answers clarified, Madam Speaker. I would think we all need to do more. We need to be hands-on. We need to do everything in our power. And I'm hopeful that with working all together and supporting legislation unanimously like this, that it's a positive step in that direction. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, for allowing me to put a few words on the records. And also, I want to thank uh, my fellow colleague from La Verandry uh, for bringing this bill forth. I, Madam Speaker, we're already in Manitoba, and we're waiting here for the federal government to bring Ukrainian refugees to Canada. Uh, I had the opportunity this past uh, weekend to attend a fundraiser in Roblin. And we all know that West Central Manitoba is a real hub and there's a lot of Ukrainians and there's a number of events. This weekend there's going to be one in Russell. Uh, to see those little uh, toddlers, those uh, four and five year olds up in the stage, Ukrainian dancing and dressed in their attire and they were proud and grandpa and grandma, Yida, Baba were there and, and watching and clapping them and they kept looking at them and knowing that they're for the attention of their parents and culture is really important. I, I kind of look back, um, you know, generations come and go and, and all denominations, we all tend to lose culture over time and it's very important for us to be able to, to maintain that type of culture and this bill just does that for it. Um, I remember back in Cowan, you know, on Christmas Eve we put hay on the floor you know, and it was it kind of was representation of the manger and where uh, baby Jesus was born and all those kind of things. We would go on Shiatia, uh, you know, you go around to the houses and it would be to try to prosper the upcoming season that the, the uh, it would be a bountiful crop and we'd go there and see Shiatia, Yasper, the Neshet, the Rasna, the Dravi, and the Navik, and so on. And you'd go there and, and the, the I remember the elderly babas would come to the door and they did not want the wheat put on their floor. They would go and have a basin and they'd put it on the steps and they'd make sure that you threw the wheat into the steps because they didn't want to have to sweep up the mess after and this was all kind of neat stuff that happened and, uh, and they would give you a nickel. And if they gave you a dime while you hit pay dirt, you know, we'd all be smiling and we'd always miss the morning of school at uh, Cowan Ridge. To be able to uh, to be able to experience that, and that that type of culture is important. Steady Vachem, when we go on Ukrainian New Year's Eve and go to the windows, and the families would be having their Ukrainian New Year's supper, and we would go ahead and we'd sing outside the window. Of course, we'd wait for the or for all the the senior people in our group, like the ones that were in grade 11 and 12, because they knew the words, and we just kind of have to move our lips to, you know, make those things happen. So that's why it's important. And, you know, we, we look uh, at a lot, of the, a lot of the things that are going on in the world. And, you know, we, our government, of course, provided the $800,000 for humanitarian aid in Ukraine, uh, 650 to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, 100. 50,000 to the Manitoba Con Council for International Cooperation. Our government waived the 500 nominee program fee. So, you know, when we look at it, this is so important today for us to move this bill forward because right now is where our Ukrainian families and friends are looking for support and knowing that this legislature today passes, this bill will really give a boost to morale. So uh, with that, since we do have 180,000 Ukrainian Manitobans, our doors are open. We're waiting anxiously for the federal government to do their part. Madam Speaker, we're ready to welcome our Ukrainian friends and families. Manitobas are anxious and many communities are ready and we are seeing that. So let's make it happen and let's get this bill passed today and I won't say anything further so that we can give that support to our Ukrainian friends. Thank you. Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill 223, the Ukrainian Heritage Month Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed. 
Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. Uh, the Honourable Member for La Verandre. We'd like to ask for if it's a unanimous vote. Call, declared a Called, Is declared there a leave of the vote? House to recognize it as a unanimous vote? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Member for Lavrandre. On a point of order. Uh, the Honourable Member for Lavrandre on a point of order. I'd like to thank everybody in the House for uh, letting this bill move on. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate the member's comments, but it was not a point of order. Um, The Honourable, uh, and I had indicated that uh, it was a good point, but not a point of order. I had indicated that. The Honourable uh, Minister of Agriculture. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, ask that the House consider uh, the resolution number nine. Um, oh, uh, sorry, yeah. So we can do the motion. I'd like to see if the House can recognize that as 11 o'clock. Is there a leave to call it 11 o'clock? Leave has been granted. The hour is now 11 a.m. and the time for private members' resolutions. The resolution before us this morning is the resolution on recognizing climate resiliency and green strategies in Manitoba transportation, brought forward by the Honourable Member for McPhillips. The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Madam Speaker, I move. Uh, second by the MLA for Brandon East. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba commend the, the provincial government for introduced legislation that will allow for the testing of reduced emission transportation and better shared paths for active transportation in order to improve the climate resiliency of Manitoba. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for McPhillips, seconded by the Honourable Member for Brandon East. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba commend the provincial government for introducing legislation that will allow for the testing of reduced emission transportation and better shared paths for active transportation in order to improve the climate resiliency of Manitoba. The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's always a pleasure to rise in the House and, and be part of the democratic process, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, especially in light, and I congratulate my uh, colleague, the MLA for Lavaronde and all members of this House for uh, passing the uh, bill uh, to move it on to the next stage for recognizing uh, Ukrainian Heritage Month. Uh, Madam Speaker, we've seen and, and we heard uh, from all members of this House, and, and in particular, uh, the, the member for St. John's, and, when she was talking about the, the horrific uh, crimes against women in, in Ukraine. Um, and, and we've heard from all members uh, images uh, of, of individuals uh, being shot in the back of the head, tied, uh, and uh, mass graves. Uh, and clearly, uh, the war crimes going on, Madam Speaker. And yet, we in this, we in this chamber and, and we in this chamber across Manitoba are privileged, privileged that, that we get to stand here and be part of, of democracy, of how democracy should work. And, and while there are times, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that it can, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, be partisan uh, and go off, off the rails, uh, I know uh, Madam Speaker has actually sent up some correspondence recently urging us to, to uh, improve our, our decorum. Uh, but when we see uh, in Ukraine uh, uh, mayors being, uh, and their families being arrested, rounded up, and that suppression of democracy, it, just, it should make all of us uh, value it that much more. Um, that being said, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of the one of the outlets and one of the consequences of of COVID, when we were all locked uh, and and restricted and limited uh, uh, in terms of of interaction and ability to be out and about, what we saw uh, was an increasing number of Manitobans wanting to reconnect with nature, uh, reconnect with being outside, reconnect uh, with neighbors and friends, 
but in a, a socially distant manner, in a, in a uh, healthy, responsible manner. And, and so a lot of people uh, began walking, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and with that uh, came the uh, municipal, uh, uh, municipal government, the City of Winnipeg, introducing and, and bringing forward an open streets uh, plan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and they designated a number of sections of, of the city, a number of city streets. I mean, Wellington is obviously a, a terrific example, as it's often been designated as a primary pedestrian quarter on certain days. But the city of Winnipeg expanded this. Now, there were, of course, issues, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as there, as there always is when, when governments uh, attempt to uh, do things that, that something hasn't been uh, done before. Uh, and despite, you know, obviously the support of, of Winnipeggers and Manitobans for the idea of, of open streets, um, there was some legislative concern about uh, about liability and such. And so, I think it's it's important that we bring in legislation to make those kind of corrections, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, so that everyone uh, can have that opportunity in a safe manner to be outside and, and enjoy not only the physical benefits that comes with, with activity, but also the, the mental health benefits that come with that kind of uh, activity, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because we all uh, know very much that uh, Manitobans and, and indeed uh, Canadians, uh, mental health has, has uh, taken, uh, taken a bit of a hit uh, during, during the last two years. A number of people have struggled. So again, fostering and allowing that opportunity uh, for people to reconnect uh, while uh, uh, reducing our greenhouse emissions, I think, is a, is a win-win, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The other component that we need to look at, and, and the other component uh, that this resolution speaks to, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the introduction of e-vehicles, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And we've seen an explosion. I, I, I remember uh, late last year, Mr. Deputy Speaker, going to uh, Alter Ego Sports and, and Woodcock Cycle, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, to find some parts for my bicycle. And it was incredible uh, talking to them. Uh, that they, they couldn't keep the supply up. And, and obviously there was a component to that of, of, uh, of supply uh, chain issues, but there was a larger component that, that citizens in, in large had, had just seized on, on bicycles as, as a viable uh, means of, of transportation. Uh, and we, we see that, we see that all around. Uh, we, we see the fat bikes uh, that we've all seen in the winter along the Assiniboine, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and also what's becoming increasingly popular uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in terms of, of, of e-transportation, are these pedal assist bikes, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in which, you know, whether you buy it as is, as a pedal assist uh, with a battery component, uh, or whether or not you take a current, uh, current bicycle you own and, and go in online and, and buy yourself an upgrade kit uh, to allow for that pedal assist. But I know in, in talking to a number of seniors uh, who have uh, pedal assist bikes, they, they value that opportunity to not only so that they can uh, exercise, um, but they can they can do that much more. But like so many people uh, and so many cyclists, they want to ensure, and we want to ensure, uh, that they are indeed safe and protected um, from vehicle traffic. So it is important that we, we take a look and that we, we designate and, and we assist municipalities in designated open streets that allow for the safe uh, transportation or the safe usage by pedestrians, as well as alternative uh, uh, green uh, means of transportation, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So as we move forward into this summer, I have no doubt that we're going to have any, uh, an increasing number of municipalities looking at open streets and looking at this idea, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And so when we look at the statistics, I, I mean, they're very clear uh, in terms of what municipalities need to do. Uh, they need to look at a, uh, probably a minimum of, of three kilometres in, in terms of a, 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 a continuous path uh, would be in the uh, best. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we need to ensure uh, that when those streets are blocked off, uh, that it's clearly marked and, and signed. Uh, so that again, that we can protect uh, those pedestrians uh, and that e-transportation. Because this is where we need to go as a society. Whether, whether it is us as individuals uh, bicycling to work, whether it's us as individuals using mass transit, we all have a role in, in ad addressing the climate uh, crisis that we have here. Uh, on, on, this, uh, on this planet, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And while in and of itself, uh, this, uh, uh, this action uh, by our government will obviously only uh, um, incrementally uh, move us towards any kind of greenhouse goals, but like anything else, Mr. Deputy Speaker, good or bad, it all adds up. And so any opportunity that we can facilitate 
Manitobans utilizing or engaging in new technologies that, that move away from fossil fuel use. Anytime that we can, we can engage and allow Manitobans that encouragement to ride uh, bicycles or other means of active uh, transportation, whether it's to improve their physical or, or mental or, or emotional health, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do that. And we saw firsthand last summer that this is what Manitobans want and this is what they are looking for from their governments, whether it's municipal or provincial. And they're looking for it just not on, on, just not on, on city streets uh, in that designation, but all throughout uh, the province of Manitoba. So as, as, as new developments uh, come in, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I see, and we all see that, that active transportation, that active component of those communities, whether it's in uh, uh, Bridgewater or, or new development uh, just uh, out in, uh, in Southwest St. Paul, you constantly see that development as part of it, that active transportation as part of the larger development so that we can meet those needs. So again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we all need to do our part. We all need to take a look at our own, our own fossil fuel consumption, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, we need to, to take a look at those alternatives, whether it is an e-bike or, or any others. But we also have to understand, too, when, when we look at all other alternative means, especially most of them today seem to be uh, battery related. There are environmental consequences with the use of batteries, in particular uh, uh, the rare earth elements uh, required in a lot of the production. And uh, we simply don't have a lot of this uh, within Canada. Uh, the majority of actually is in, in uh, uh, South America has the largest uh, deposits in, and as well as uh, Africa, the continent of Africa also has significant deposits. But again, difficult to get to very environmentally damaging to get to. So again, there are consequences, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but, but again, uh, like any, any, uh, any citizen, uh, through proper research uh, and, and involvement uh, and knowledge, we can make those best choices. Uh, so Mr. Deputy Speaker, I look forward to uh, uh, discussion and, and being involved in the uh, d democratic process uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and with those few words, I thank you for your time. question period of up to 10 minutes will be held and questions may be addressed in the following sequence. The first question may be asked by a member from another party. Any subsequent questions must follow a rotation between parties. Each independent member may ask one question and no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The Honourable Member from Wolseley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you to the member for bringing forward this resolution. I'm certain that uh, members of my constituency would appreciate getting back to the shared street model and having more opportunity for active transportation. But if we're going to be talking about climate resiliency and green strategies, we have to go further. So I'd like to ask the member who brought this forward if he can tell me when his government will be implementing the recommendations from the Expert Advisory Council to the Minister of Sustainable Development on their, their recommendations for a green transportation strategy for Manitoba. When will that be implemented? And will it be before the deadline of December 2022? The Honourable Member from McPhillips. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank my colleague uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we can all play, uh, uh, the goal here is not uh, to get involved in, in partisan debate. I mean, we could point out the Auditor General's previous comments about the NDP's uh, climate plan. I think his quote was written on the back of a napkin. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think the resolution's clear. This is, is, this is about ensuring that municipalities have the legislative and re regulatory needs and requirements to ensure a safe uh, open street model uh, for their citizens. The Honourable Member from Riding Mountain. Good morning, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank my uh, good friend and colleague from McPhillips for this resolution this morning. It's a very important resolution, especially for the cities in our, our province here. Uh, can the member from McPhillips please tell me some of the benefits that open streets can have here in Manitoba? The Honourable Member from McPhillips. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank my uh, colleague for that question. I mean, the benefits are, are numerous and, and they're evident as we see in our own activity when we're out and about 
uh, whether it's, it's walking our, our dogs, whether it's walking with a family, whether it's walking with our neighbours. So not only do we have a reduction in terms of, of greenhouse gases, the vehicles that are, that are left uh, in their driveways as people use other means, uh, but more importantly, we allow individuals to re-engage uh, with each other in, in a safe uh, manner. Uh, that they are protected, and more importantly, that they can they can assist and rebuild their mental and physical health uh, going forward. The honourable member from Saint Boniface. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question about uh, that relates to transit. I mean, which is which is connected to active transportation simply because people walk to transit. Um, has there been any consideration as part of this to? Um, to help the city of Winnipeg or other municipalities with the purchase of uh, electric buses from New Flyer, which would be a natural uh, fit for, for Manitoba. The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and I thank my colleague for that question. Um, and, and while electric buses uh, do provide, uh, obviously, benefits in terms of greenhouse reductions, it's important to remember that in the open streets uh, in the summer uh, last year and, and going forward, there will be no uh, uh, vehicle uh, traffic allowed on that, whether it's a, whether it's a car, whether it's a bus, or, or whether it's a semi-truck. The idea is to designate it safe corridors for pedestrians and for individuals that are using uh, e-powered vehicles, whether it's a, like uh, e-powered scooters um, and those kind of devices. So larger vehicles that would uh, uh, pose a threat uh, to pedestrians will not be allowed and have not been allowed under the uh, open streets concept. The Honourable Member for Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I just uh, I want to correct uh, misinformation on the record. Buses still use the open streets concept, um, so that is a mistake that we just heard. Um, and so for. I'm going to also just repeat the title of this PMR, Recognizing Climate Resiliency and Green Strategies in Manitoba Transportation. And I think it's a fair question to ask the member one more time if he has any idea when his government will be implementing the green transportation strategy for Manitoba that was recommended to the Minister of Sustainable Development from your own expert advisory council. It's directly related to this bill. Members, time has expired. The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank my colleague for that question. Uh, I think my colleague is, is attempting to use this as a, as a question period to the minister uh, responsible for, for the environment. This is clearly outside the bounds of the resolution. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm just urging all Manitobans to make use of open streets, uh, to use them in a, in a safe manner, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and to ensure that we are all doing our part to ensure a sustainable environment, not only for our children, but for our grandchildren, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think we all have a role to play in this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and, and to take uh, the quote, it all adds up. So all our small steps, whether it's you know, using LED light bulbs, whether it is, is getting more fuel-efficient vehicles, or whether it's simply walking uh, to work. Members, uh, time has is expired. The Honourable Member for Brandon East. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. I, again, I too want to thank the member from um, Phillips for bringing this very important resolution forward. We have a lot of history in uh, rural Manitoba, uh, especially in, in a, another small city, uh, which is Brandon, on the open street concept. Um, I'm just wondering if the member can explain if he has any concerns or heard of any concerns with the additional foot traffic and bus traffic and vehicle traffic. Are there any concerns with traffic congestion? The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I also, just before I respond to the minister's or the member's question, I'd like to uh, thank him and his uh, for his hospitality during the Royal Manitoba uh, Winter Fair recently. Uh, but that being said, obviously, uh, safety uh, of individuals of, of pedestrians is paramount of any jurisdictions when they designate an open street. And so, ensuring the safe separation of, of vehicle traffic to pedestrians to individuals on east or, or on e-vehicles, e-scooters. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is is of paramount importance, and we've seen that the, the, the statistics, whether from uh, MPI, have shown uh, that there is decreased uh, accidents, whether it's vehicle vehicle accidents, whether it's vehicle pedestrian, when these models are used and used appropriately. The Honourable Member for Wolseley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
Um, the Progressive Conservative Government cut 50-50 funding for transit. Does the member support restoring 50-50 funding for transit as part of a green transportation strategy? The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I appreciate uh, my colleague's support for open streets, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This kind of concept, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and said it's a proven concept. The legislation that, this, that, that we're, we're supporting uh, in this resolution will build upon the success of open streets that we saw last year in the City of Winnipeg and expand it beyond, but, uh, but more importantly, give municipalities the, the legislative uh, where, wherewithal to ensure that they are legally uh, protected, their liability is protected, but that we allow for the expansion of this opportunity for individuals to use every mode of, of energy efficient, climate resilient uh, transportation that's suitable, uh, that allows us to not only enjoy the fresh air and enjoy the outside, but more importantly, take action. The member's time has basis. expired. The honorable member for Riding Mountain. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. Now, I know my colleague for McPhillips is a very active person. He's often out cycling, I know that. I'm just wondering if he can tell the House about his experiences with open streets in Winnipeg here last year. The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank my uh, colleague for that question. And, and like many, many Manitobans, uh, I made use of, of open streets. Uh, riding around uh, West St. Paul at times, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and, and bicycling. And it's a great opportunity to not only engage uh, with constituents and, and neighbours, but more importantly, it's, it's an opportunity for you to re-engage as, as an individual into your own uh, personal wellness, whether it's physical wellness or emotional or mental health, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, but it also leaves you with that knowledge and, and that knowing that you have done something that makes a difference in the larger climate resiliency issue. And again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, all, all actions, no matter how small, uh, make a difference the honourable in the member's big picture. time has expired. The honourable member for Wolseley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I note that uh, the preamble to this PMR specifically talks about, um, and I'll just read it from the notes, improving access and expanding the options for reduced emission transportation, being a concrete step to reduce the environmental impact of this province. So in addition to open streets, can the member tell us what his government is doing um, to make uh, zero emission vehicles and public transportation more accessible to Manitobans. Mm -hmm. The Honourable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I, and I thank my colleague for that question, because it is an important question when we deal with zero emission uh, vehicles, and, and the member would be fully aware uh, that many uh, individuals, whether here in Manitoba or, or North America, are indeed looking at zero emission vehicles, but the challenge has become one of supply and demand. Most individuals now, and I was actually out uh, this weekend uh, talking to some auto uh, places, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and they were noting it's about a two-year wait for a zero emission uh, vehicle like a Tesla, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So obviously there are significant, significant issues. That's not to say that we shouldn't all be making an effort on an individual basis and as a community basis to make a difference in a safe, sustainable manner. Time for questions has expired. Debate is now open. The Honourable Member for Wolseley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I will comment that uh, the open streets concept is definitely something that many folks in Winnipeg have been seeking. There is an enormous amount of disappointment in my community last year when it was discovered that a, you know something in the Provincial Highway Act prevented the city from being able to allow the open street concepts that they had allowed in 2020. There are definitely some challenges. You know, I've certainly seen that on Wolseley Avenue. There's challenges with managing um, how the streets are shared, and, and as I mentioned earlier, even with the open streets concept, there is a bus that runs through Wolseley, there are delivery trucks that run through Wolseley, um, and, the, and some folks need to access that street, even if it's just for a block, because it's literally the only way to get out of their 
their home to some other part of the city. So there's still challenges, there's issues for um, the city to the municipality to work out, but I know that many, many folks in Wolseley will absolutely welcome this and folks across the province as well. So, you know, I'm grateful that those changes are being made in the Highway and Transportation Bill. I, on the other hand, I'm pretty confused by this resolution because a resolution that talks about green strategies in Manitoba transportation, but the member can only speak to people walking or riding bikes is missing something. Obviously, active transportation is a really important part of our fight about, against climate change. But if we can't have some movement, rapid, rapid movement in this province on electric vehicles, on electric transportation, on electric school buses, on all kinds of ways for reducing um, climate carbon emissions, then, then we're not gonna get anywhere. We're just continue to fall further and further behind the rest of the country. So I referenced earlier during the question period that the Manitoba, this government has a, um, a, an expert advisory committee, and I've read all the reports that have come out of this committee, um, and particularly the last two, um, it, this one pertaining to um, active transportation, I think is actually an incredible piece of work. I think that the folks who have um, been in this role have really put together a meaningful plan and recommendation. But what I see, I, I just don't see any action on it. Um, so the timeline from this plan that I'm looking at it right now is that Manitoba should develop a green transportation strategy that will be approved by the minister no later than December 31st, 2022. So we haven't hit that deadline yet, but when a member of the government can't even comment on whether the strategy is in play, like even to say it's being worked on, even to call, you know, I've heard it tons of times in this room, you know, there's a committee working on that. Stay tuned, you know, we'll have news coming soon, but the minister can't, or the, the member couldn't even say that, which really concerns me that nothing's been happening. So further, the recommendation states that the strategy will be made available to the public. It will include a strategic direction that's consistent with, but not limited to, the recommended areas outlined below. And there's certainly pages of recommendations. Um, I'm sure all of you would enjoy a read through if you wanna take a look at that report yourself. Um, but it also asks for a supplementary document containing an implementation plan that identifies immediate short-term actions as well as long-term actions that reduce transportation emissions in sustainable and enduring ways. And there's recognition that activities consistent with the AAC recommendation should occur in advance of the completion and approval of the strategy. So it's making it very clear, and it says, early success in reducing transportation-related GHG emissions means that you have to start now. The strategy itself might not be approved until December, that's the deadline, or maybe it won't be approved at all within the term of this government, the way things are going, but that is the expectation. But the further expectation is that a number of things will already be taking place. So that means funding, um, you know, perhaps that means rebates for people who want to buy electric vehicles. Perhaps that means investing in infrastructure throughout the province so that regardless of where people live, that they could take advantage of an electric vehicle option. Perhaps it means a comprehensive education strategy so that people understand the advantages um, and the importance of making a shift to electric vehicles. Perhaps it means going back to not only 50-50 funding for the city of Winnipeg's um, transportation system, but perhaps it means specifically, you know, working with the federal government to ensure the implementation of zero emission buses, um, you know, well before, <laughs> you know, it's too late. And this province just hasn't done a lot around, uh, you know, around this. So, it's clear that the member isn't at all familiar with this um, document or, or any of these plans, but I suggest that he takes a look at this on the website if, if he actually wants you know, a, a resolution like this to have any meaning or have any teeth. It has to be about more 
than folks who have the ability and the means and the, the physical ability to walk or ride their bikes. There has to be a plan that works for everyone in this province. We know that transportation accounts for a quarter of Canada's carbon emissions and that this government needs to invest in the necessary infrastructure and enact green strategies in Manitoba transportation. Public transit, as I've already mentioned, um, but we also know that so far this government hasn't really taken the climate crisis seriously. And I love open streets, don't get me wrong, but I'm gonna say if this is the best the government can offer as a climate strategy in six years, we're in serious trouble. When this government is not cutting highway spending, they're cutting public transit spending. They ended the 50-50 transit funding deal that municipalities came to rely on. And we know that many Manitoba workers, families, and seniors rely on public transit. I've personally used public transit in two different cities for 37 years as my primary mode of transportation. And it's really only recently since the pandemic that I've made some changes in that. But I'm pretty personally connected with um, that mode of transportation, what it means for people, who rides the bus and you know, who I talked to and saw on the bus every single day for years. Um, I know what an essential component it is to Manitoba hitting its carbon reduction goals, and it keeps commuters off the road. It reduces traffic, it reduces emissions, it reduces traffic accidents. Um, it certainly reduces uh, the kind of the, the amount of um, congestion that we might find in the downtown. It makes it a more walkable, livable place for people to shop and work and live. Um, better transit simply improves the lives of people, of all Manitobans, whether they're students, workers, or seniors. But this government has failed to improve transit and has made it less affordable for Manitobans to use. Instead of investing in a modern transit system to meet the growing needs of our province, this PC government decided upon a regressive action that will make public transit less effective in a time when it's even more important. And ending the 50% agreement has caused cuts to service. It's caused cancellation of projects and it has increased the fares. And in addition to the lack of affordability of Winnipeg's transit, the, this government has failed to present a plan for Winnipeg Transit to go electric. We know that the government's had expert advice on this electrification of bus, buses. They just are refusing to act. And they keep shifting Manitoba's, or, sorry, and refusing to act to begin shifting Manitoba's fleet to electric power. We also know Manitoba's electric buses are ready to be produced. Um, there is lower operating costs, projected capital cost reductions, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware of Winnipeg-based New Flyer. It's an organization I've been aware of for some time, and I think it was maybe just last year because the pandemic delayed things, but I got to finally have a tour of their facility. Um, we asked a lot of important questions about the ability to scale up in order to meet Manitobans' needs, and it's very clear that this company could do that. Um, and, and regardless of whether, you know, I would hope that Manitoba would invest in a Manitoba company, but regardless, there's multiple competitors on the market to allow this to happen, and Manitoba is so far behind. Cities like Vancouver, Victoria, Ottawa, Toronto, a P, even the province of PEI and multiple other places across the country have managed to do this. So thank you for bringing this resolution forward, but I suggest that you uh, take it back to the drawing table and improve it. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. The honorable member for Riding Mountain. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm proud to stand up here for a few minutes and uh, put a few words on the record in uh, support of this resolution put forward by my uh, honorable friend from McPhillips. Um, our government is working hard to ensure that green alternatives are supported to help support the climate resiliency of this province. You know, more people in recent years have been taking advantage of active transportation, especially during the pandemic. And uh, this piece of legislation um, 
to improve active transportation, especially in the cities, I think is very important. Um, more Manitobans are always seeking out green transportation options and uh, they need accessibility in order for those to happen. The price of fuel these days, uh, I think it will make people rethink uh, their mode of transportation, especially when they're traveling short distances here in the city. I know in the country uh, it's a little bit different and uh, it, you know, myself two years ago I decided I was going to go on a walking plan every day and uh, you know, I enjoy my walks in my community of Shoal Lake. Um, I guess I, you'd call that active transportation, taking yourself around. In Shoal Lake, I think, uh, and many small towns in rural Manitoba, we have a lot of open streets. You rarely see cars on some streets. I live on a street that, you know, fronts on a park. And uh, you often see people on three-wheel trikes, bicycles, people walking, walking their dogs. and. Uh, Certainly in a small town, you can use active transportation a lot more because you're not hindered by all the traffic that you have here in the city of Winnipeg. So, you know, being, being a rural MLA, I, I had to get a little background on this open streets concept here in Winnipeg. And I, I understand last year, the city of Winnipeg conducted the pilot project that converted 14 streets into open streets. So the, the city of Winnipeg allowed people to walk on these streets and utilize active transportation to replace that automobile traffic for a few hours uh, by temporarily limiting vehicle access. So that was a great thing. But without cars, you know, streets are a massive public space where you can walk and not worry about uh, traffic coming behind you or in front of you. So it was a great thing. However, municipalities discovered that the Highway Traffic Act didn't support open streets. So I want to thank my, uh, my colleague, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, for introducing a bill in the legislature earlier this session that will take care of some of the problems that municipalities had with, with open streets here, especially in Winnipeg and in Brandon, Selkirk, the bigger cities. Um, last summer I was out in Kelowna, BC, and uh, I observed uh, a project there with e-scooters. What was it? Um, e-scooters. My, my friend here is asking what was Kelowna, and I said e-scooters. You know, I didn't try out these e-scooters. They looked a little uh, daunting, but many people were taking these e-scooters. Um, they use credit cards. Uh, they get the e-scooter. They, they travel wherever they want. They drop it off. Everything's GPS enabled there, and it was quite slick. And each night, these e-scooters are charged fully, I guess, by the companies. I think there's three or four companies in Kelowna that's doing that right now. And I couldn't believe how popular they were in the downtown area of Kelowna. And I think any of you familiar with Kelowna will know it's maybe not the open streets concept because there's lots of pathways in downtown Kelowna that these were on. But they were also on, on sidewalks, on streets as well in the downtown area. So, you know, this, this project is being then... Um, the City of Kelowna is monitoring the results of this, and from what I've heard, it's been a great success. I think at the start, they were worried about vandalism to these scooters and things, but I never seen any of that there, and I kind of marveled at, you know, four or five scooters sitting in a drop-off location when I went out for a walk at 7 in the morning, and uh, I just marveled that there was no vandalism to these at all. But uh, So it was a great project, and I think uh, that's the type of active transportation I think this bill is... Uh, looking to accomplish here in Manitoba with electric bikes. My friend from McPhillips has been in investigating an electric bike, and I think the cost of electric bikes is still pretty high. I think that needs to come down, something like Teslas, electric cars. I think they're all going to come down as we move forward here, and more and more manufacturers are making them, and cities embrace active transportation even more. So, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, I think that uh, that's all I really want to say today about active transportation. I think uh, the more active all of us can be, the, I think the healthier we're going to be and less stress on our health care system, which we need, and uh, longer lives for all of us here. So I, I fully support this resolution this morning, and uh, I hope my colleagues will as well. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. James. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. It's good to have an opportunity to put uh, a few words on the record in response to this resolution. Um, it is indeed a positive thing to see uh, this government exploring the, the you know, expansion of open streets 
and to uh, support the testing of uh, lower emissions vehicles like e-scooters, etc. This is positive and uh, it is a step in the right direction. But uh, respectfully, uh, no commitments are, are in order here to this government. Um, the actions that are proposed here barely even scrape the surface of the fundamental problem that we're facing in this province in terms of a runaway uh, emissions issue. And we've seen uh, little to no action of any kind from this government in taking real steps, uh, real measures to actually work to uh, reduce emissions in this province, especially as it relates to transportation emissions, which uh, are our fastest growing area of emissions. And uh, in fact, under this government, we've seen emissions grow year after year after year. And that's not spin, that's just fact. Uh, and so, you know, that's the, the fundamental uh, challenge that we face here in this province, but we've seen, we've seen nothing at all. Uh, no action, no policy from this government that's actually responding to that core problem uh, that we're facing, that fundamentally our, our planet is facing. You know, while those emissions in Manitoba are skyrocketing, Manitobans are starting to feel the impacts of climate change. Uh, we're seeing the climate crisis here at home. Last summer we saw wildfires knock out power to two uh, communities uh, and they, you know, suffered for months on end without access to power. Um, we're seeing droughts uh, impact uh, our farmers. And, uh, you know, we've seen municipalities declare uh, a threat of the Red River possibly running dry. Uh, so these issues are starting to come home. We're feeling these things here now in Manitoba. And yet while Manitobans are experiencing that, while we're seeing this happen, uh, this government continues to actively contribute to making that problem worse. And uh, that's a real concern, I think, for everyday Manitobans that are right to be worried about what they're seeing happening in the world around them. And so instead of action, what we've seen from this government is a lot of greenwashing, um, a lot of uh, you know, playing around, nibbling around the edges. We've set up a, a carbon savings account system here in this province that allows the government to continuously kick the bucket down the road. No real targets of any kind that commits the government to actually needing to genuinely make an effort to reduce emissions in this province. And you know, in response to those critiques, what we often hear from, from members of this government is that, uh, well, you know, we've made our investments. We've invested in hydro historically, so we don't need to do that. It's a, it's a very bizarre argument because, of course, only a fraction of the energy we use is renewable. Uh, the vast majority of the energy we use in this province is carbon-based. And yet, again, uh, no action and just continued refusal to do anything or, or, or to take any genuine actions uh, from this government. And in fact, their own climate and green plan, which commits to making Manitoba supposedly the, the greenest place uh, in Canada, doesn't even mention decarbonization. It doesn't even mention that as a key focus or, or one, as one of its pillars. Completely ignores that. So what does that say about their perspective on the future of this province or the future that they want to leave for our kids? It says that they're not paying attention to that. It says that they're ignoring that. And they're ignoring the realities that the, you know, the IPCC, the International uh, Panel on Climate Change, uh, laid out for us, which is uh, you know, a disastrous future if we fail to take action. In Manitoba, while we are only part of the broader issue, we do need to step up and do our part. We've fallen so incredibly far behind the rest of this country in taking action, especially as it relates to greening transportation. We can look at uh, new uh, zero emission vehicle registrations in other provinces in Canada. BC in Q3 of 2021, 13% of all new vehicles were electric vehicles. Quebec, 10% during the same quarter. Manitoba, 1.6%. This is uh, how we measure up or how we stack up to the other provinces in this country that are in a similar position to us that have in immense hydroelectric wealth. And we see those other province, provinces taking action to leverage that wealth to help their populations to do better, to live healthier lives, to save money, to help contribute to a, a cleaner energy future. But here we've done nothing. We have the second lowest EV adoption rate in Canada. We see other provinces committing to transitioning their fleet vehicles 
to, to transitioning them entirely over to zero emissions by 2040. Manitoba, zero commitment, no action of any kind. Um, other provinces are offering thousands in incentives to help their citizens be able to take part in moving to a cleaner energy approach to transportation and moving towards the electrification of their vehicles. In Manitoba, zero. We, don't, we haven't done anything at all to help ensure that Manitobans can be beneficiaries of the cost savings that can be generated by moving to an electric vehicle if they're able to afford one. Um, we've also seen uh, them make cuts to public transit instead of investing in public transit. You know, we're here again talking about uh, the, res the resolution speaks to the value of looking at uh, lowering emissions in this province, and yet this same government that's put forward this resolution has actually cut funding to transit. How can they stand behind that? That makes zero sense. We're moving backwards, and as a result, transit fares in, in Winnipeg have been forced to go up. We've seen cuts to routes. Less and less people are able to be able to rely on transit because this government has decided to make cuts where we should have been making investments. Other provinces have had mandates to require electric vehicle charging infrastructure to be put in new buildings. Again, nothing in this province. A huge missed opportunity where we're committing more and more people to buying uh, gas vehicles because they don't have a choice, because they have nowhere to charge when they're living in their maybe condominium or their apartment building. We've seen other provinces invest millions in active transportation. Again, uh, no meaningful action from this government to speak of. So uh, we're just, we miss opportunity after opportunity. And you know, overall, the biggest concern here that I think we can point to is that there's been zero investment from this province in expanding access to electric vehicle charging infrastructure. If you own an electric vehicle in Manitoba, or, or if you're thinking about owning one, you're probably thinking twice about that, because you don't know if you can actually take a trip somewhere. You can't rely on getting access to that, because the government hasn't made a single investment in that. Nothing. Think about how embarrassing that is in a province as wealthy as ours, in, in terms of our, our access to hydroelectric energy. We have the opportunity here to create um, uh, a huge explosion in, in the number of people who transition over to electric vehicles, but we're not able to do that. We're not able to, to help people transition because this government has failed to make any investments. We need to make investments in active transportation infrastructure. We need to restore funding to transit, 50-50 funding. We need to do that. We, now, we need to ensure that we allow our municipalities to move towards functional transit so people can ensure that they can rely on buses being there when they need to be there. We need to help municipalities move towards electrifying their transit fleets. We need to ensure people can have greater access to car share, things like Peg City Co-op, so that they can expand, uh, expand their fleets so more uh, Manitobans can actually, instead of having to buy a vehicle, can rely on ride share. That's an uh, excellent way to go. But again, this government has done nothing to support that. We need a plan to expand access to EV charging. That's a mandatory thing we need to see from this government. Again, no action, that has to happen. And we need to see some support for consumers who may want to buy an electric vehicle so that they can be part of that transition, so that they can afford to do that and they can be beneficiaries of the savings here. The opportunity for this province is massive. It's a huge opportunity, not only to clean our air, to create healthier communities, but to reduce transportation costs for Manitobans, to increase revenues for hydro, to grow our economy, as my colleague spoke to. We have uh, an, a bus manufacturer right here in Winnipeg that could actually produce the electric buses that could help to serve Manitobans. And yet, we've done nothing. We need to make those investments. We need to do that. And most importantly, not only for economic reasons, not only um, for reasons that will help to increase revenues for hydro, which these investments would do, but most importantly so that we can leave a future livable planet for our kids. That is really what's at stake here, and that's what this government has failed to consider. It's clear that they haven't taken that to heart, and we need to make sure that we make these investments to make, make it so that Manitobans can actually have access to greener transportation, cleaner transportation, this resolution does not go far enough. I thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, in principle, this is a fine 
uh, resolution. I, I think it suffers from, it's, I think it's called the tyranny of low expectations, uh, <laughs> simply in that it's, it's commending the provincial government for introducing legislation. Uh, I sometimes joke when people thank me for any work that I do, is that the headline should be hero politician does job. But um, this is, again, this is an extremely low bar to set in terms of, um, and that is a, and given the fact that even in the last two weeks there have been uh, rising clamor from the IPCC and others saying we're at a tipping point, that it's absolutely critical that we uh, have bold action, that's, this is not what we're seeing, just introducing uh, legislation. There are enormous things that could have been done, but we've sort of seen 30 years or so of greenwashing uh, from governments of both stripes in Manitoba. Uh, it's often been mentioned that the Auditor General had, had a report about um, uh, that, that under the NDP that there were inadequate measures as far as greenhouse uh, tackling climate change. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, putting it to the side since then. And it's, even in the last two years, it's become incredibly clear how important it is um, when we talk about um, supply chain uh, issues. I was at a, I was at a, the Western Lumber uh, Conference uh, the other day and uh, when we talked about their supply chain shortages, a lot of it has to do with disasters related to climate change. That there was a massive storm uh, off uh, British Columbia that wiped out uh, rail and roads. Uh, there have been you know, huge storms in the Gulf of Mexico that have uh, wiped out uh, places that make resin. All these, but, and, and what's happening is that these are the results uh, we're seeing inflation and, and, and supply chain crises being driven by uh, climate change. Um, and it is also true that Manitoba, of all the jurisdictions in Canada and in many jurisdictions in the world, few jurisdictions have more to benefit and have more capacity to act on this issue than uh, Manitoba does. Uh, it doesn't have to focus entirely on uh, electric vehicles. There are things we can, we can actually achieve enormous amounts of uh, a change by just having better transit, by letting people get out of their cars so that they don't all have to climb in, so you don't have uh, traffic jams with uh, traffic backed up for miles with one person in every car. Um, that we actually have effective and functional uh, transit in both in Winnipeg and across uh, across Manitoba, uh, both within municipalities and between municipalities should be a goal uh, because we've seen the, the, the collapse of uh, intercity buses. We, we, we are more than happy to pay for the, for, to help people get around in, within the city, which is important. Um, but it's also something we should be considering in order to make sure that people in remote and rural areas also have access to transportation as well. There are tremendous opportunities around electrification that we should be investing in. Uh, and this, these are very much baby steps. When we're talking about carbon footprints, these are baby steps and when we need to be making great strides and we need to be making them as quickly as possible. So I do commend, I do commend the member for McPhillips for bringing this forward, uh, modest though it be. Uh, so I will, uh, that being said, is that we need, we really need to be making uh, much more significant investments. And there are lots, there are all sorts of ideas uh, that are out there that have been extremely positive, great innovation uh, and ways in which we can all harness uh, and work together on this. It doesn't matter whether you live in the city or whether you uh, are a farmer, that there are things that uh, farmers can do as well uh, to, to help uh, sequester carbon and it's something we should all be working towards. So with that, I'll thank you very much and I'll leave those comments on the record. Honourable Member for Brandon East. Here, here. Thank you very much uh, I, again, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. It's. Um, Cognizant of the time, I just want to put a few words on the record in, in support of what this resolution does. Um, when we look at active transportation, whether it be the open streets, whether it be working with municipalities to create bicycle lanes, this resolution is to recognize the initiatives that are put forth by the municipality. In this case, we are talking open streets with the city of Winnipeg. And I think it's important that we as provincial legislators um, stand behind the commitment that we make with our municipalities. Yes, we, this, this is a time to debate. This is a time to stand up in the House, put your views on record, uh, to go back and forth and, and try to understand the other views. But the resolution itself is to support an initiative that the City of Winnipeg has taken in trying to, in, in establishing a program um, 
that puts out active transportation. I know in, in Brandon, we have a bike path uh, that goes around the entire city. And you can certainly walk it, you can bike it. It takes a little while because it does go around the entire city, but it is there. We also have Lorne Avenue, which is a bike sharing uh, idea where you to share the road campaign. So they're out there. So it's initiatives like this that help us recognize green transportation. And uh, as the member from Wolseley talks about the initiatives for green transportation, absolutely 100%. I totally agree. I actually chaired in Brandon uh, for a number of years their uh, environment committee. Um, and not on in my duties in, in any way, shape, or form when I was on city council. This was outside of city council. And I sat on the committee for, for, I believe, three years, and then I chaired it for a number of years until 2016. To this day, they still share their invites to their meetings and the minutes of their meetings with me because green initiatives, environmental issues need to be a concern for all of us. So uh, again, I totally support um, the resolution. Is there more that we need to do as a government? 100% there is more we need to do. But there is certainly no fault at taking the opportunity to congratulate the city of Winnipeg. With that, I will uh, sit down and hopefully ask for the question. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to put some words on the record with regards to this uh, particular resolution here this morning. And I, I just wanted to start by sort of picking up where the member for St. James left off, and that is on missed opportunities. Uh, you know, he was talking a lot about uh, the missed opportunities when it comes to uh, using Manitoba Hydro, leveraging Manitoba Hydro in order to electrify our, our transportation system. Uh, but I think that the, the, there's a broader theme uh, here uh, with regards to missed opportunities uh, that this government continues to uh, drop the ball on. And in this case, the, the specifically what I'm talking about is the element of the Open Streets program, which again, the, my colleague from uh, Wolseley and St. James both talked about how in important that program has been for their constituents, but just for the broader, uh, uh, you know, mental health and wellness of people throughout this uh, pandemic and even, you know, long before that, of course. Uh, but we really did have an opportunity, a specific moment in time, where we had broad consensus, broad support across all the all political uh, backgrounds and, and spectrum, with regards to the importance of being outside, of using active transportation, as I said, as a, not only just a you know, physical wellness, but mental wellness. Uh, we had an opportunity through the pandemic, uh, you know, of, of all the, uh, the terrible things that have happened during the pandemic, this could have been one of the elements of, uh, of positive that came out of the, the, the lessons learned of the pandemic, was that we could have used that time, that leveraged that time, uh, in order to uh, enhance and make better our active transportation networks and systems in this province. And in fact, here in the city of Winnipeg, as, as was the case, I think it's been mentioned by a members opposite, in other municipalities across the province, use that opportunity, use that time to do things like the Open Streets uh, Initiative where you had you know, streets that we could say, no, for this period of time or, or you know, throughout the pandemic, these are streets that we are going to dedicate to uh, active transportation. We are gonna uh, invite the public to use them, uh, to get outside, enjoy our beautiful Manitoba scenery and, and, and weather. And we, we had that, as I said, that consensus across political spectrum from the municipalities on up uh, through to the province. And did the province take advantage of that? No, they did not. They had the opportunity to bring this kind of legislation forward. We called on them to bring this legislation forward. The city of Winnipeg begged them to bring this legislation forward. And here we are, uh, you know, it's, uh, well, it was a beautiful day when I came in to work. I know it's, it, it, I, I think maybe the rain has started, so we're gonna see a little bit of, uh, of uh, weather, but I understand this, this uh, weekend, this week and weekend are going to be beautiful. 
we're going to see more and more Winnipeggers coming out and trying to use their their streets in the way that uh, that we have throughout the pandemic. And once again, they're going to be running up against the roadblock. It's a simple bureaucratic change, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It didn't need, you know, study and, uh, and, and you know, complex legislation drafted. This is basic, straightforward uh, stuff that this province could have done, that this government could have taken initiative of on and did not. So, you know, I, hey, we're, we're in support of open streets. We're in support of more active transportation. But when you have a government that the, one of their first acts of business when they came into power in 2016 was to cut the active transportation coordinator that was established under the NDP government here in Manitoba that did great work, including, uh, you know, in my own constituency, the Northeast Pioneers Greenway, worked with the community, worked with um, trails groups and active transportation and Bike Winnipeg and so many other groups to come up with a comprehensive plan, not just for the city, but even when we did the uh, interchange at Highway 101 and Highway 59, the first provincial project to incorporate active transportation at the very design level, that didn't just happen by accident. It happened because it was pushed by the community, amplified by local uh, politicians, myself included, I don't mind saying, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but then coordinated by an active transportation coordinator, cut by this government with no consideration of what that impact will have uh, going forward. So it's missed opportunity after missed opportunity. Um, I, I just want to just quickly uh, touch on, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, um, uh, the element of personal mobility devices and electric order. When this matter is again before the House, the Honourable Member from Concordia will have five minutes remaining, the hour being 12 p.m. This House is recessed and stands recessed until 1.30 p.m.